It's time for To The Last Drop Podcast with Liam Delcom and Brandon Nell. Welcome to our latest episode of To The Last Drop. With me, as per usual, is Brendan Nell. Uh, and this week, we are looking ahead to the Springboks quarterfinal against France at the Stade France. To help us plough through all of this, because there's quite a bit to get through, uh, we've got one of the uh, finest rugby brands in the country with us today. And we're very thankful for him, uh, to him for his uh, for the time he set aside uh, to join us. So the brain. Welcome to our show. Thanks, Liam. Thank you. It's so nice to talk to you guys. Thanks, Brendan. Well, yeah, look, there's a lot to get through, Swiss. Um, and, uh, yeah, let, let me just firstly give Brendan a chance to say hello as well. Sorry, Brendan. <laughs> don't worry. I don't mind. I don't mind being in the background. Uh, I was just going to say, Swiss has got a tee off time soon, so we can't waste too much of his time. Oh, dear. Uh, even though he's going to be playing in the rain today, it looks like it's going to be a bit wet. Stay out of the water, Swiss. <laughs> yeah, I don't see too much. We need the rain, but it's always the toss up, you know, between the rain. And the golf, but in this case, I think the rain is more important. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, uh, there's a lot to get through. Um, it's a huge game. Uh, you know, South Africa going to this game with a, a fairly decent record. Um, and France as well, if you look at their performances over the last year and a half. Um, Brendan told me about a, a little stat earlier that was quite fascinating. You know, sometimes you get an idea in your head and you kind of reinforce it as you go along. Uh, until you are tapped on the shoulder and, you know, pointed in the right direction. Um, and, and this pertains to the box scrum. Brendan, tell us. Yeah, yeah it, was just, it was quite a, quite an interesting one, yeah. Um, we always think the spring box scrum is the best in, in the uh, in the competition. I'm just trying to get the the, the stat here. Uh, but, yeah, the, the, the box scrum is the seventh best in the competition, and I thought that was quite fascinating. I didn't think, I didn't think we were that bad. I take it that's in t- terms of own scrums won. The Springboks have also lost the most scrums per game of this group for the second worst success rate, 81%, and rank only fifth for line-out success, 89%. Yeah, that, that just just quickly on that, though, the, the, the scrum stats, that normally can be very subjective as well. For example, there you had three or four scrums in a game and uh, one penalty against one four, then suddenly it starts the whole stat up. So it, uh, seen as a whole, we're still looking good with the platform from a scrum that we have, uh, you know. And 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 often you look at a competition of scrums, it'll be 92, 91, 98. It's very close that percentages on on a scrum stat. So that's a bit of a misleading stat. Uh, what is what is important is one or two scrums after half time that we did got penalised, uh, which wasn't good in 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 in, in our previous game. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so uh, you need to win the right scrums at the right time. For example, in our half, I know Rossi wants a scrum for penalty. In their half, he wants in, out to play to see if we can get our forwards on, on quick ball. So it all depends as well where is the scrum and what do you want to achieve. Sometimes you just want to set up to kick out or, or whatever situ- the situation is. But I still believe we've got a very good platform from our scrums. So as given our resources and the way we deploy it, because we've got uh, front rankers in particular that, uh, you know, the, the workload is spread almost 50-50 because these guys are, are very similar in terms of the output. Um, what does that do to a scrum? Do you, do you think that, um, you know, other teams might uh, rely more on a particular uh, set of, of front, front rankers who play longer? Uh, in terms of output and consistency, what, what do you think that does to our scrum? Yeah, just firstly, if I understand you correctly, Liam, uh, we've got two packs of forward, two two sets of tight five. And with before Malcolm's injury, we had a definite uh, cuts off Malcolm Franz front row and Trevor Bongi and, and, and Ox front row. And why they work so well in combination as well, uh, these two front rows, is because of their years of playing together, firstly. Secondly, their height and how they set and getting used to one another. A front row is very much like a halfback pairing. They, you get a unit and you get together. Yeah, so I don't know if, you, if I answered your question correctly. I think I missed mm. the first part slightly. But uh, we've, we're very fortunate. But now with Malcolm out, the, the dynamic has changed a bit. With Dion Fury coming in, it's not. he is definitely a very good player. He steals ball. He's a loose forward. But I'm not so convinced that he's in the same, that he's in the same category as scrumming uh, compared to the other two. 
Yeah, I was gonna. So, so I mean, the one thing that I think to me is 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 still the biggest worry for me this weekend's game is is the fact that we tend to, and this is not a new thing. This entire season, we've created a lot of chances in the twenty-two. We get ourselves into those try-scoring positions, and and we, and we don't finish them off. Um, Jacques spoken about it a number of times in press conferences. Um, we've seen it. Uh, we've seen it. Be a, obviously a huge factor against Ireland. I know everyone concentrated on the goal kicking, but that to me was the deadliest part of it. Um, just I don't know from a coach's point of view, how do you one rectify that? And what are, what do you see as the problem? Why we don't finish off these chances? Yeah, firstly, uh, there's not much variation. It's off nine. Off nine means uh, nine is the passer to a forward to dips and then a cleaner, and there they go. And they repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. And good defensive teams can defend that all day. And sooner or later, uh, you know, there's a there's a penalty or or someone diving in. It's very hard to stay focused and concentrate on attack if you're one dimensional. Meaning there's no guy coming from the outside shoulder running onto the blind eye. There's no pick and go in between. Uh, you know, there's no switch maybe from 12 with the forwards back. So we just playing and that same thing we're backing our physical strength which helps for us the advantage if you do that with the Lord now every time I dip and drive there might be a head contact so and not for the attacking team for the defensive team so I don't know what's their method and their madness I can play until I get until I get a yellow if if I attack well with my head with this stupid law application at the moment and I can't I don't have a better word for it because it's getting a fuss. Uh, but on your question, we are at the moment, unfortunately, a bit one-dimensional with our with our with our red zone play. Meaning, when we need to go convert and convert and score the try. That's an interesting one uh, in that uh, the way you explained it there. It's, it's you know, there's you can make a case for for doing the same thing, and you know, you kind of get the reward if you you know if you do it well. Um, the box that has been said often over the last while have, have added a layer to the attacking play. Um, it's a World Cup quarterfinal this time. Um, how do you how would you navigate those waters? Do you do you play sort of what we know as sort of term knockout rugby, or do you continue with the way they've gone about their business? Yeah, it's very dangerous now to come with new fancy stuff. You got to stick to your DNA. I have to first question earlier, got to scrum well and your malls and line has got to be good so that you can get the front front football. It's all about the launch, you know, and we did it so well before the World Cup. If we pretend like we're going to maul and see our breaks out and we hit the vacuum and Andre Estres or Damien Dalinda, they're so powerful with that. So we can turn their shoulders, we can get them on the front foot. But at the at, at the moment, to answer your question, we can't be too fancy. We got to play, build an innings, and go to our strength and take three points in six points that Rossi picked up to now. Where I would have gone for a few more balls, uh, you know, kick it for corner. Because how do you bring your pack into play, Liam? There's only one thing if you wanna you got to do it from lineouts, uh, especially, and 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 if you or scrums and if you play a lot you get a lot of scrums and and it leads to penalties so that you can kick it out and so the one feeds the other but mm. if you every time just take three points and you don't really bring your power pack into play or your two packs and they kick off again from your off set up a box kick you're taking your you're taking your wisdom teeth out by doing that so mm. for me I'll Definitely be, could do what we do, more well, scrum well, uh, go at the right times for the, especially those kicks that you know might be missed. Uh, you know, if I know it's a slot, a different story, you want to build scoreboard pressure. But there's various ways of building score, scoreboard pressure. And for me, with our brilliant tight fives that we have, two of them, or two packs of forwards, the more they play, I, I, oh man, I remember so well, if you play a lot, and you pick and go, and you run. Who, may, who must defend? Their tighties. So if you play a lot, and you tire their tighties, and now suddenly they must stop a maul, and there's a mistake. I want to scrum a lot, play a lot, and maul a lot if I've got two packs of forwards. I don't want to take three points and and, and go and uh, receive a kickoff. And the play of the match is only 27 minutes. I want to take the play to... If I've got two packs, I want to have 36 minutes of rugby. Then I'll, mm. I'll, I'll, you can take them to the cleaners. But mm. you don't want to give that one pack of these every time chance, kick for pulse, rest a minute, kick off, play there. Uh, 
that is the chess game that I, I feel we must get right if we want success. Just on that point, so it's, and we've amused about this in the, in the World Cup, uh, some of the reporters, whether it hasn't been a ploy, maybe a ploy by the box, because uh, the mall hasn't been used with the frequency that we uh, perhaps expected them to, to use it. Uh, do you think it's something that they've deliberately decided to hide? Maybe, maybe. Because uh, uh, cast your mind back a few weeks, we were definitely fantastic with not only the mall playing off the mall as well. You see the variation and the blindside tries we scored with our hookers, if you can recall that. So if you've got your four or five options, and we call it the rhino attack system of your lineouts, if you're very clever with that, you know, you do bring your guys into play. But to answer your question, maybe they, they were hiding it up to now, because if you want to come with something special, it's now the time. Uh, and and so it's just on that point. I mean, I suppose it comes down to the next question, which I think a lot of South Africa is asking: Who do you play then? If you're going to play not fancy rugby, you're going to play knockout rugby. Do you still go with Marnie, uh, or do you go with Andre? Because been there, done that, BMT, all that sort of argument. How they deploy those two is, is up to them. I will definitely go now. Use Marnie uh, later later on when the forwards are more tired, when there's more space. Bring him on as an impact player, but you got to bring him on. you got to utilize him. Or you, you move on 100 to 12 and you bring him in as a combination. I said it in the past as well. I think it's eight times every time when Elton came on and, all, and Pollard moved to 12, we won the game. So, and then and the, you see, then you can, then your space is wide is a bit more open. But how they utilize that uh, for starters, uh, I think it is, uh, I would have gone for Pollard. Uh, although I'm not saying he's better than 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 Marnie, uh, I say Marnie is brilliant, and Marnie showed it in the URC. And Marnie came up, and his confidence is up. He came up that first kick, uh, uh, taking over from Pollard when he slotted that as Brendan, that I was standing up in my lounge and, and praying and hoping that he slots it, and he did. So his confidence is back up. He did give the credit to Pollard that they're a combination; they back one another. Yeah, so. Uh, Start with start with Pollard, see how it goes, because he can take us direct, you know, with the the, with the 12 centre. He likes that. He likes the show and go, where Marnie likes playing out the back more, and using his feet and his and his and his uh, and his talents wider. I was going to say also the other the other talking point is of course Anton Dupont, Le Petit, Petit Zorro, as we are calling him. Apparently, he's going to play with a scrum cap and a mask. So he's going to look uh, rather bizarre when he comes on. We, yeah, we, heard, <laughs> we asked this question last week. Someone's, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, just on that, someone said he's going to look like mankind on <laughs> WWF. <laughs> yeah, um, we asked the question of Dobbo, John Dobson last week. He was on the pod last week. And we asked him about you know, bringing in a guy like that at this week and rushing him back and you know what sort of the, the psychology of it. And Dobbo had quite an interesting answer where he said, yeah, the um, the fact that you he's done it, it's, it's backfired on him in the past where, with Evan Ruiz, where he gave him until the captain's practice, until the warm-up, and then the guy w withdraws in the warm-up or gets a knock in the first five minutes of the game. And he says you can actually see the whole team deflate. Very, very good point. I had a, a talk yesterday with rugby guys about this as well. I hope for their sake that upon made enough contact that he's ready in his mind because one thing, uh, you know, if there's opportunity, you won't find, find much. But if you, you hit him, the guy's going to hit him hard. They're definitely going to test him up. Is his mind strong enough? And 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 then if it's too late, you know, so that can backfire for them, for sure. That can definitely backfire for them. But then listening to guys earlier about his, his uh, mental toughness, they say he's one of those guys you don't rattle him. Uh, uh, in his rugby career from a junior as well. That's his biggest attribute. His calmness, it doesn't matter what happens to him, he can he can stand up and fight, you know. So uh, I, I think it depends on the individual. I remember with certain guys, I won't mention names, oh, you, if you take a, if you wait till the end, you know he's going to pack up in the, in the warm-up or he's going to pack up early in the game and that's a killer. You don't, you, you don't want that, uh, want, want that either. See, you see, the position is important as well. If he was a front row or loose forward or a centre with that face problem, different scenario. But playing nine, you, you can definitely, the, 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 the situation in the back can protect him.
just on that point, uh, Rassi was kind of asked about uh, Dupont uh, in yesterday's press conference, um, and he made the point that um, Dupont never looks like he's flustered or he's never sort of broken into a sweat in, in matches. So Exactly, was, that's my yeah. point. Mm. He's mentally, Liam, he's mentally so tough, uh, you know, and, and that's a picture he portrays to the team as well. That's why they'll push him, they'll start with him and they'll... F- and, and I'm, I'm sure you'll be fine. But things saying that, if that bone uh, is still a problem, they wouldn't have played him. There's no mm. way. Because they, apparently yeah. that thing can't break a second time. Then you sit with troubles. Then it's face surgery. And then it's a, then it's not a good one. Uh, mm. So he, he's fine. The, 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 the question is what Brendan asked. Is he fine in his mind? You know, mm. that is the question as well. Yeah, and then it's going to be hunchback of Notre Dame um, territory. To get into the, <laughs> I mean, the other thing I wanted to ask you, and it's it's, it's almost on the same point, um, the dynamic uh, uh, of a Dante potentially running at Mani if Mani starts, um, and as well as Damien Dalende at at Jalabe. Um, do you think those two uh, channels will will get a lot of traffic, and and how the potential flyers will deal with it? Yeah, obvious, uh, for, for sure, because they, they'll prep a big, big, big time on the mall stop, both teams, because you don't want to get mauled. Psychology tells you once they maul you, you it, 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 you know, one negative builds and, and it becomes synergy. One plus one becomes four. You don't want to get mauled. So what I would do, if I if they're going to stop our mall, I'll practice a lot of pulling out of that mall and on the 10-12 gap right on the outside shoulder of Tim, and then do a job on him, you know. And if I say do a job, especially on the cleaning section, uh, I remember when we played years back, we played Foley, and our plan was on Foley from the mall. They think we're going to mall, we're not mauling, we're on Foley. And whenever you clean Foley, you tell Foley there's more to come. So, so that is one of those ploys that I would definitely utilize especially, you know, if the right runner comes around that corner and, and a soft pass from the hooker to Darlinda or or to Estres and kind of a carrier there, or even the loose forward himself, you just pump your legs and you say, okay, here we go. So 10-12 channel, definitely, and especially on the on the weaker shoulder then of that 10 defending there. Last question from me, Swayze, is just, I mean, last year the box you know, came close with 14 men. They had that red card quite early. Um, and obviously there was the whole controversy with Wayne Barnes with some of the decisions he made right at the end of that game. But um, do you think that that sort of factors any – I know it's a total, it's World Cup, the pressure is different, and the games often in the past don't really matter. But the, the fact that the box went there and with 14 men almost won that game, do you think that will give them some some sort of confidence going into this game? For sure, for sure. I went through that game again two uh, two days ago. There's one or two things that happened there that – that concerned me. We can't carry and get isolated two or three times. You know, that that for me was a concern. But they'll get a lot of confidence that we could really – just remember, it was it was 14 men, but then for the last uh, 15 mm. minutes, it was 14 versus 14 again. Mm. So, when the pond got uh, sent off. Yes, when the pond got, got, got sent off. But you you – that gives help anything that gives confidence or markers that you that happened in the past that you can use to give confidence. So Rossi will mention a few times, guys. Yeah, we we gave them with fourteen men. Imagine what you can do with fifteen. That sort of so uh, that you use that. You put that in the fridge and you use that to 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 give you confidence. In fact, he addressed that matter yesterday, uh, and he said that oh, although he? it was a defeat. Um, that was probably one of the proudest moments that he felt, um, even in defeat, the way the team responded and the way they problem solved almost by themselves. They, you know, they figured things out and they, you know, they fronted up and did what they needed to do. So, um, uh, Liam, I didn't see the interview, but I tell you one thing for nothing. I know Rasi well, and he's the master of the mind. He gives you t- them tons and tons and tons of confidence and he picked various things. He knows. He's got in his arsenal of various things that he used to get them up already maximum. So I, I'm not surprised that it's uh, that he would say, you know, guys, we did it with 14. We'll do it with 13. Imagine we've got 15, you know, that sort of thing. And and say it at the right times as well. He picks his timing with these things perfectly as well. Yeah, no, well, it's going to be it's going to be a humding over game, man. So, I think we're going to let you go for your tea of time. I think uh, you you're probably ready to swing a few golf clubs there. But thanks for joining us. 
uh, it's been very insightful. And yeah, uh, hopefully we uh, we have that perfect game because I think the box are going to need to do a, be a lot more disciplined uh, and a lot more focused and clinical than they probably were against Ireland if they're going to win this one. So uh, thanks for joining us again and, and hope you have a good round. Yeah, listen, always speaking to, to masterminds like you two is such a pleasure. And you you did say it at the end. The, the most, most important thing with the crowds, with everything, there is going to be discipline. Discipline, 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 because the 50-50 calls will go against us and then the discipline must pull us through. <laughs> no, definitely. No, well, thanks. And then, as I say, enjoy your round and we'll we'll chat again soon about this. So thanks for joining us on the pod. Thanks, Wes. Guys, have a blessed day. Bye. Thanks. Uh, the, the second part of today's show involves uh, you know, another interview, and it's with a former Springbok. We caught up with Gathro Stienka, uh, a man who knows everything about the Springbok front row, but also knows a lot about France, having settled here uh, a good number of years ago. He played for Toulouse and played for them uh, with distinction, and uh, we tried to get his insights. Uh, so, Gathro, you um, have now been in France for quite a while, and you've developed... Um, a certain taste, no doubt. You like rosé, don't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's kind of ridiculous to see as a big guy like myself likes this big drink. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's like it's something I just fell in love with when I came to France, you know, in South Africa. Always the brandy and the Coke and so on and our beers. <laughs> and, you know, when, when, I, when I came to France, you know, I discovered rosé. I've always liked a good white wine. And I just really bought into the culture, having a good old girl called the Provence, uh, mm. which I really enjoy. And actually, uh, while I was still playing by the, with the box, I always found a way to buy some French rosé and while we'll be having our fines meetings and the other guys are having beers I'll be having a rosé so the guys always to make fun of me about it but yeah I think it's something really French um, something you don't find anywhere and you know one thing learning from the French culture is really appreciating the the wines, but especially the different regions in France. So, yeah, guys are always making fun of me. They don't understand it, how this big guy, um, he loves his rosé instead of his beers. So, well, there's a nutritional aspect as well for some reason. Wow. Uh, I don't pick up weight when I drink rosé. Oh, so. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point to make. Yeah, I, I didn't know I liked rosés until I had it, uh, you know, uh, in I think it was in Bandol. Um, yeah. a, a good number of years ago. So uh, I thought, wow, okay, there's something clearly that I've missed. Do you have a, a specific go-to one? Uh, Cassis, bon, Bandol, you know, have a, a specific no, rosé you go to? I prefer, my, I love my good old uh, Côte, de, Côte de Provence. Côte de Provence. Côte de Provence, so it's in the south of France as mm. well, uh, just outside of Toulouse, great quality. Uh, I really, really enjoyed that. Okay. Arthur, thanks very much. Thanks for your time. And yeah, with all that, I'm just can't wait for Sunday night for another late night. I'm sure there's going to be another uh, bunch of sick notes in South African offices on Monday morning, especially if the Springboks win. But yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's this point of point them where we know that if we don't win, um, that's the World Cup done. It's always a very very tricky time, you know, those uh, after that game, and uh, <clears throat> we've been on both sides of that coin, both of us. So let's hope it's a it's a Springbok victory, and then we carry on in the World Cup. Yeah, and I, I don't think people realize uh, when you get knocked out how sudden your exit is because you, you're you not allowed to stay another extra night. So it's a question of doing what you need to do at the stadium, conduct the interviews, and then it's a mad dash uh, to get back to your hotel um, and, and be gone the next day, basically. So um, you basically sink without a trace. Well, yeah, I mean, I just remember in the, the Bryce Lawrence game, that horrible night in mm -hmm. Wellington, um, literally the game finished, they were out the hotel. I think we walked out the stadium about one o'clock in the morning um, and they had to be out the, the hotel at half past three to catch a six o'clock mm -hmm. flight uh, to Auckland, to Sydney, back to South Africa. So by the time we woke up the next morning, they were halfway back to South Africa. And it's just, it's just bizarre when you think that's how quickly mm -hmm. teams would have to go. But France didn't have to travel very far then, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, and hopefully uh, they will, well, no, I won't say hopefully, because uh, we want them to stay. <laughs> um, yeah, so the flights will be later, so you can at least, um, I'm not suggesting you have a, a you know, a, a lie in with a croissant. Um, but yeah, it, it'll be, it, it's, it's, it's a bit more humane <laughs> the way you exit. <laughs> Well, they just have to get in their cars and drive home then, obviously. Let's hope it's that. That's to the last drop this week. Uh, we'll chat to you again next week where we'll know if the box are still in the World Cup. 
Thanks for listening. And a reminder, you can find all the To The Last Drop podcasts on the Brendan Nell YouTube channel, iono.fm, Spotify, player.fm, Pocket Casts, Google Podcasts, and iTunes, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts.